Server-side rendering is a staple feature of modern web app frameworks. If you want to be cool, you just need to have it. You, the most popular way to build web apps using the Rust language, has added server-side rendering for the 0.20 release. You takes a bit of a bring-your-own-server approach to server-side rendering. While frameworks like Next.js and SvelteKit provide the server for you, you simply gives you the ability to render your components to a string in a non-WebAssembly context. How you deliver the rendered output to the client is left up to you. This adds a bit more configuration for the developer, but it's nice in that it gives you the flexibility to choose your own backend framework. Let's look at how to set up U server-side rendering using ActixWeb as our backend. We have this ultra simple app that displays blogs stored in an AWS DynamoDB table. This app includes a simple U router setup that currently only has one route that contains a blog component. Currently, all the rendering is done on the client side, but we're gonna convert it to be partially rendered on the server side. Now, if you watch previous videos, you'll be familiar with the project structure. We have a workspace that contains front end, back end, and common crates. We created a symbolic link in the back end directory to the dist directory of the front end crate, which is the front end build output. This allows our back end to serve the static front end files. The back end now needs to include you and its dependencies, so add it with the SSR and Tokyo features. We're using the GitHub repo URL here. You'll likely want to specify a specific version instead. Since we're going to need to import our app components in the back end to render them, add the front end crate as a dependency as well. To render on the server, you'll need to have your backend code call this and serve the resulting HTML string to the user. We'll create a function for a new Actix web service that does just this. Decorate the function with the Actix get macro, specifying this pattern so that it matches all paths. We'll want to give the path to the U router so the U application can perform routing as it did before. Read the index.html file from the front end build output into a string. We call unwrap here for brevity. In reality, you'd probably want to do some error handling. We'll be interpolating the rendered application into this HTML after we render it, similar to what you would do when rendering on the client side. The U router we use on the server side requires us to pass in the URL, so let's pass that in via some props. The root component of our app on the client side is called app, but we're going to create a new root component called server app in a minute that makes some small adjustments to be able to render in a non WebAssembly environment. Its rendered output should be the same as the original app component. So we'll reference that new root component when we call server render dot render, passing in the props that we just created. Then we'll return an HTTP response, specifying text slash HTML for the content type. The body will be the index.html file we read from file with the rendered U app placed inside that. Next, we'll need to add the service to our Actix web application by passing our new function to another .service call. It's important to note that this .service call needs to come last in the chain because our new handler will match every URL that wasn't already matched. There's one more thing we need to do on the backend side. Because our rendered app will reference some external CSS and WebAssembly files, we need to have Actix serve those as well. Add another .service call immediately prior to the last one specifying the front end build output directory dot slash dist. We also specify slash dist as a mount path for all static files so we don't conflict with routes in our U app. Now onto the changes we need to make on the front end side. In trunk.toml, we'll need to specify a public URL of slash dist so our app prefixes external file requests with slash dist. In cargo.toml, specify the CSR and hydration features for you. We'll need to define our root components in lib.rs instead of main.rs so that they can be added as dependencies in the backend. If you're migrating an existing application to server-side rendering, it's likely that your existing code includes things that only run in a WebAssembly context. If you try to render your app on the server, you'll probably run into error messages like this. Migrating to server-side rendering will include tracking all these down and either ensuring that they only run on the client side by putting them inside use effect or by changing them so that they can run in a non WebAssembly context. One example of this is RecWASM, which you might be using to perform HTTP requests to the backend. To make sure these are only run on the client side, make sure they are inside a use effect closure. The browser router component is another example of this. It assumes a WebAssembly compilation target. U provides another component, simply called router, that does essentially the same thing, but can be rendered on the server. So as we alluded to earlier, we're going to create a second root component called server app that mirrors what the app component does, but with router instead of browser router. This is the component that we reference from our backend code. Now back to the front end main function. In a purely client side rendered U app, you simply call something like this or this in your main function. Since now rendering will initially be done on the server, instead of invoking .render, you'll invoke .hydrate. This will render anything remaining on the client side. 
Okay, now let's run this thing. We'll run trunk build in the front end directory to make sure our static files are up to date. Then we'll run our back end directly from our IDE. So we can see our blog post now after a loading message flashed briefly on the screen with a timestamp. If we look in developer tools, we can see what happened. First, the browser requested blog one, which triggered a server side render of the app and returned this HTML. You can see the loading message along with the timestamp came directly pre-rendered from the server. Because actually fetching the blog post data is still done in use effect, that will continue to happen on the client side. After receiving this initial HTML, the browser then loads the CSS, WebAssembly, and JavaScript files as usual and begins executing the client side portion of the app, which requests the blog post from the back end and re renders the page when they are received. If we wanted to, we could potentially make blog post retrieval happen on the server side as well. That's an overview of server side rendering with you. Drop a comment below if you have any questions. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.